Thank you very much, Cynthia. It's really a pleasure to be here to talk to you. Uh, Cynthia's been discussing how, how this program operates. In fact, I had the pleasure last Friday walking into the cafeteria at the NSA running with Jim Anderson, so we had a nice little discussion on what his visit was like here. And I certainly hope uh, we have an opportunity to really discuss what I consider to be one of the really significant problems in computer security. Uh, one that I think will be significant for at least the next five to 10 years, namely the secure composition problem. And what I'd like to do with respect to that is first give you a little bit of an overview of what the problems are all about, discuss a theory that addresses the composition issue, and then talk about some of its applications and also some conclusions. What I'd also like to encourage you to do is at any point in time, you can certainly keep this informative and informal. If you wish to interject some, some thoughts, please let me know, and that would be more than adequate with me. In fact, I would really encourage that. First thing I'd like to do is really describe what the problem is all about. And that is, suppose you have a system and you want to address security relevant pieces of it either the entire system or components. And I think throughout the talk, it might be useful to think of this along the lines of we're going to operate on the internet and how we protect information as it flows through the system. And what we really have difficulty doing very well is understanding the security behavior of many interacting components. It could be that we know each of the pieces themselves, but the then question becomes, as information close through a system, how we protect the information. Uh, we may have information residing on two computers, and then it becomes a question of going through the operating systems across the network in terms of routers, and it's how all these elements of the entire system interact in security matter. One of the real challenges is to be able to design secure systems using unreliable components and as I think most of you are very, aware, very much aware of, the tendency is to use commercial off-the-shelf pieces of equipment. And how do they interconnect? How do you protect information when using these types of components? Because they have not been built for security in mind. And especially those who have had some kind of exposure to computer security, we, we've known since the 70s that uh, systems that have been built in the past have been easy to penetrate and the only way to protect systems appropriately is to build them from the start. So this particular description here is very vital in the sense of we're going to be trying to build computers and computer systems based on components that were not designed for security of mind, designed for functionality, and it becomes a very much of a challenge to impose security on top of that and have some kind of level of assurance that you're able to do that. And that's, that's the crux of the problem. What I'd first like to do is spend a little bit of time putting things in perspective. The first notion of what is composition really refers to the standard uh, dictionary definition, to form by putting together. We have individual pieces doing specific, piece, specific functions. How do they all fit together? What's important is why in the world we're even interested in composing systems. And especially as we talked about before, we're talking about very, very large systems composed of COTS products. What's very, very difficult to do is to understand when you have a very, very complicated system, how to decompose that and how to handle complexity. So just as we talk about software taking a very tough complex system and breaking up individual pieces. We talk about a very large, complex network, breaking it up into components to handle individual functionality. Especially from the viewpoint, as we addressed earlier, the functionality hasn't already been pre-described and defined and designed for that purpose. It's a question of using what's already available. We're always interested in having a reusability question come into place, and it's also a very important notion to be able to reduce costs, schedules, and risk. How do you do that with the commercial off-the-shelf pieces of equipment? The other important question is, why is this so hard to do? 
Today's large systems demand incredible flexibility. If you look at the phone system, they always have to be available. If you look at a lot of networks, you always want to have the ability to interconnect with other people, exchange information. We're now in the world of video. We're sending video across our networks. So we, and we have constantly have pieces of equipment that are failing that still have a lot of redundancy so we can get information across the systems. What we're interested in doing now is to be able to do that in a secure manner, especially when we start talking about conducting business across the internet, talking about electronic commerce, being able to try to send credit cards across the internet, do it in such a way that we protect the information. Security becomes an extremely challenging problem. One of the large, largest elements on why this is so difficult to do is that we haven't learned over the years how to handle this thing from a complete systems perspective. We have a fairly decent idea how some of the individual pieces fit together and how they operate, but we really do not have a good understanding of how the entire system operates and how everything interconnects. So that's the thrust of the secure composition problem. What I'd like to do is then, with, with that understanding, talk about what's been done in this whole arena and how we're going to get some understanding on how to handle this type of problem. For Cynthia's class, we had given out a paper written by the authors of this composition problem, and those in our, in our class have had an opportunity to read over this theory. This was developed by three people. Benzinger, George Denault, and Mark Utami. This was developed over the last five years. We refer to this as the WDL theory of composition. WDL comes just from the name of the company that did it, Western Development Labs. The original work was developed under the Rao Corporation, which as in today's world, things constantly change. They now become Lockheed Martin. So what we do is we try to go back to the commonality of Western Development Lab in case they, they move again and get bought up by another, another company, they'll still remain as Western Development Labs, so we'll talk about the WDL. When this thing first came out, we referred to this as the Rao, and figured that wasn't going to do it. Uh, what this basis is, is, is these people have been involved with developing components, integrating into large networks, and been doing this for well over 10 years. And what we're really trying to talk about is having a mathematical framework to understand how to deal with the composition problem. So we have a mathematical underpinnings to allow us to talk about how to build large complex systems. I'll spend a little bit of time going over how that came about, what the elements are all about, so you have some notion of where the composition theory comes from, how to use it, how systems developers can use this technology to build things. And we'll also talk about where we stand now, where where things have been applied in this whole arena. Again, this is a mathematical theory for dealing with large, complex systems. Lee Benzinger, one of the developers of the system, likes to refer to this as a mathematics for bubble diagrams. Most of you in this audience are either engineers or computer scientists, and if you think of standard computer science tools or data flow diagrams and talk about how information flows through a system, computer system in particular, how you can compose software into their pieces. You try to do that functionally by looking at them as separate pieces. A bubble or a bubble diagram is one way to talk about data flow. What Lee likes to think about this as a mechanism or a mathematics behind flow of information in terms of bubbles. Thinking typically in terms of the structure of software design principles. It is really an information flow model. Where the motivation for this comes from was, was they've been modeling uh, internet packets and looking at, at how you route them through internets. The work was also developed uh, by supporting an Air Force project called the Multi-Net Gateway, which was really talking about, uh, for the Air Force, how you interconnect multiple networks and gateways. And what they really did is they, they, they took some time after the project was over, and this was mostly George Denault who was very much involved with this. And for those that have heard a little bit about uh, the Orange Book and, and talking about trust levels, 
multi-net gateway was one of these systems that was going to be rated at the A1 level. So there has a lot of high-level mathematical modeling behind the underpinnings of, of, of their tool or their methodology more appropriately. And let's talk about what that really translates into. The elements of this theory consist of a mathematical model, a mathematics which establishes system security. The notion really is, if I want to talk about the entire system being secure, I want to talk about the properties of each component we have. And when I'm talking about, from a network standpoint, maybe a backbone, backplane, a trusted network interface, a trusted file server, those kinds of components, including routers, that have to interplay with one another. At the heart of this is this notion or mathematical definition of what compositions are. I'll give you a little bit of an intuition behind this concept and how you can use it for modeling. What was done, as is in almost any mathematical framework, is really the notion of what a mathematical model is. There are certain undefined primitive terms based, again, on the notions of an internet and the notions of meshes passing systems and packets floating across the network. And then you build things up and come up with axioms or actual theorems based on these axioms. And the theorems are going to allow you to take results about, talk about the results of the system. The underlying algebra of composition is, is either referred to as the algebra of composition or the calculus of composition. We'll get into that very, very briefly, but for a large extent. The, the details of the mathematical theory are very, very much secondary. What's really important is where, where things fit together. And let's try to take a look at it from a systems perspective, or in particular from a designer's viewpoint. And you can think of it as the analogy if you're going to design a software system, what's the overall properties you want, want, want the system to have, and how you're going to distribute it through the individual pieces. And the typical understanding from a security standpoint is if we have a set of components, and think of these as black boxes, you can think of it as a computer, you can even, for that matter, we can even think of this view graph machine as an element of the system if, for instance, we were actually doing some kind of live internet exchange. So any piece of equipment that is going to allow transmission of information or data across the internet could be thought of as a component of the system. And if you're going to be a designer of the system, you want to look at it from the viewpoint of, suppose we have a set of components, each satisfying some kind of security property. Then what we'd like to do is make the assumption or be able to prove that the entire system, the composition, putting together information flowing from a view graph to an internet to a computer, the end result, the translation of all that information can be done in a secure manner. So this is the hope. You know, then, then the fundamental question is, how do you make sure that occurs? And underneath this assumption are two basic views. Because what we want to talk about is the notion of taking one security property and being able to compose it throughout all the components. For example, let's talk about integrity. Integrity is a good, a good example. Suppose Cynthia and I we're going to exchange some information. Particularly, she's going to send some data to me. What she wants to make sure of is she's going to do it here on the West Coast and say if I'm back on the East Coast and she sends it across the Internet. What both of us anticipate and expect to happen <coughs> is that when I receive that information, it's exactly the same shape that Cynthia sent it to me. So what I want to make sure of is as her database, say that's say she, she has taken an element off, off of the Naval Postgraduate School database, that's going to be a file. And she wants to make sure that information gets to me intact. So as that goes through the entire internet and gets to, into my hands, I want to be assured that when I receive it, that that's exactly the way Cynthia sent it to me. So the first portion becomes along the lines, determine a property, for instance, data integrity, that is preserved. Each of the, each of the elements that the system passes through, that data passes through, maintains that integrity. The file remains uncorrupted, intact, exactly as she sent it. And it goes from a computer here at the Naval Postgraduate School 
down to some router over across the internet to a whole series of other routers and eventually getting to me. Each and every single piece of equipment that that goes through should, if designed properly, maintain the integrity of the, of the file that sent this into me. Then when it comes to my end, I can look at it, and I know it came from Cynthia, and it's still intact. So that's the component composition viewpoint, that each and every element of the system protected me. There's also another viewpoint from an entire policy standpoint. Notice I had said before that I'm going to get it from Cynthia. I want to know that it really came from Cynthia. So I now have a composition of policies in the sense that the data must be intact, non-corrupted. Anything I receive on, the, on my home computer or my computer at work comes from someone. I have some level of assurance that it really came from the person who originally sent it. So I receive a file that says it came from Cynthia. I have the identification and authentication policies that are put into place that I can verify it really came from Cynthia. So how do I handle that situation when I have multiple policy concerns in place? And that's the policy composition, where I then have to look at the entire system. They include integrity, identification and authentication, appropriate access controls, or if we're dealing with things, on, on, especially at uh, some any type of classified information, that the appropriate classification levels are maintained. So access control policies and security levels must all come into play. If I have that type of requirement, I have to talk about how all of those policy uh, considerations are addressed by each of the elements in the system. So I look at that from the viewpoint of proposing policies. So when I talk about secure composition, it's not only the composition of a single property through components, but it could also and very frequently be the composition of entire sets of policies. And that's what we're really trying to address. Then the, the question means, the question comes about, how do we do this? And what kind of theories are available? In particular, this WDL theory, what does that address? So what I want to do is spend a little bit of time discussing what the basic elements are. And these are listed as their undefined terms. The basic element is this thing called an ID, or information unit. And that could, address anything you want to talk about. In terms of Cynthia and I sending information back and forth or an electronic message, an information unit would contain the data itself, would also perhaps have to contain addressing information on how she gets information back and forth to me. Could also contain security levels to talk about who has access to what. We've talked before even in a, in a local area Cynthia teaches here at the Naval Postgraduate School. She may have an entire class and have various projects that can involve. And she may have teams. Each of the teams may have a different level. Some of that information may go to one team and not others. That information would be encoded within this information unit. To talk about all that. Underneath, as part of the information unit, is something called data. Whatever that may translate. If you have a project, in fact, if you're going to submit grades, the data itself may be the grades for the students in the class. But it's still an undefined aspect. For DOD purposes, we play a, place a lot of emphasis on security levels. We talk about unclassified, classified types of information. What we typically talk about is a lattice of security labels, ordered by some kind of security relationship, usually denoted by less than or equal sign. So these are the the fundamental building blocks that are undefined. And when I say undefined, what that means is if you're going to apply the theory for your particular application, you're going to give meanings to each and every single one of these, depending on what you're addressing. And if it could even be describing protocols, and we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. So the next few slides are going to be the little bit of mathematics that we're going to discuss. What's important is I as an information unit, but we're now going to talk about the sets of information units. So the symbol power set of IU is a set of all subsets of information units. What's useful to think about this, especially if you look at any system, you usually think of inputs and outputs. Well, 
The underlying principle is the information unit is going to contain all the information you're going to deal with. So if I say I'm going to have input, it's going to be a set of information units, and I'm going to produce a set of information units from outputs. So that's why you see at the bottom a set of a pair of information, a pair of sets of information units. I'm going to think of a set of information units as input to a system producing a set of information units called an output. That translates into, within the next two slides, what a system's going to look like, or a component, or a policy. What we're talking about are inputs and outputs. D, remember, was a pair of inputs and outputs. The fundamental notion in the WDL theory is this concept of a delta, which is really an input-output pair. A set of information units put into the system to produce a set of outputs. The collection of input and output pairs is what a component is going to be. What's listed here is just the relation. A lot of you have heard this, the terminology of finite state machines or deterministic systems or non-deterministic systems. The key in here is a relation to allow us to talk about non-deterministic systems. I can take in a non-deterministic system, I can take the same set of inputs and produce two completely different sets of outputs. Where that translates in, into the WDL theory is I can have the same set of inputs to produce one output, the same set of inputs to produce a second set of outputs. So I can have two separate deltas with the same inputs producing two separate outputs. This is not a function, it's a relation. All right? So the thing that's important is this gives you a system that allows you to talk about non-deterministic systems. If you make outputs unique to each input, you can talk about a deterministic system. So you have the flexibility, and that's the, the nice part of it. Now, pictorially, what that translates into is you have a set of inputs run through a component, produce a set of outputs. The input-output pairs are one element of the component. So a component is nothing more than a set or a collection of input-output sets. And we can view either the entire system this way, or a piece of that system this way, or even a policy. And one thing I would like you to realize within the WDL theory is you can compose either policies or components. And that's because you can view either policy systems or components from the same viewpoint, namely a set of input-output pairs. It's the only thing that I think is very fundamental for you to understand. The couple of functions that we want to talk about, because I want to get specific about how, how you compose a particular policy. Associated with an input unit, we've talked about a security level. And that's what this first function deals with. Every input has a security label associated with it. We're talking about inputs as a set of information units. So I have a set of information units, each having perhaps its own security level. What I want to talk about is the security level for that set of inputs. So the function security level for a set of inputs is done as follows. If I talk about a set that has no inputs, I assign it to security level system low, which is going to be lower than anything else in the system. So we, and then what I really use is the lattice structure that we talked about before. And it says, if this is a non-empty set of information units, use the lattice notion of least upper bound. Anytime you have multiple inputs, you can construct an element called the least upper bound. And what you can think about in terms of security levels, what that typically amounts to is if I have some information at an unclassified level, some of it confidential and some of the secret level, and I put them all together, what I'm going to talk about is the security level of the entire thing will be at the highest level, say the secret level. And that's all that's occurring in here. The reason I'm going to talk about that is I'm going to talk about a standard policy that, that, that comes into place whenever we're talking about security levels. And that is, if we have different security levels, well, I want to make sure that information does not flow off. If I am an unclassified user and Cynthia is a confidential user, I'm not allowed to get her information. I can send information up to her, but I can't have it come down. So what I have to make sure of 
is that the output of this process, the security level has to be at least as large as the security level of the input. And what I'm talking about in particular, if I send, and look at it from a violation standpoint, I can't have Cynthia's confidential information as input come to me as output, and I receive something confidential that I'm not allowed to have. And what I'm talking about is the basic mathematical description of this policy, which we call read down, write up. And all I'm saying in here is if I send information to Cynthia and she's at a higher level, anything that comes out of any action I take has to be at least as high a level as what I sent in. All right, so this is just nothing more than a mathematical statement that reflects information not being allowed to flow down from high to low. And all we're saying in here is the definition for a component is remember that compares an input set and an output set. And we're saying a component will satisfy this policy if I take my inputs and produce an output and make sure the security level of the input is less than or equal to the security level of the output. So this is just a mathematical statement of a policy that we want. And all we're really talking about is how you describe a policy within this system, within this theory. And it's nothing more than just defining it and saying a component is read down, write up if a component consists of deltas, which are input output pairs, and each of them satisfy a particular property. So a read down, write up policy says it's a set of input output sets that have the property that each and every single delta in that component or system has the property that the security level of its inputs is less than or equal to the security level of the outputs. So that's the definition. Then the fundamental question comes into play. If we have two components that each satisfy this property, how do we, just, how do we make sure that we take the inputs from one, put it in as outputs, of the first one into inputs of the second one to generate outputs of the second one, and the whole process produces something that goes from the first to the third, satisfying this property. So let's talk about that pictorially and just give some general comments. And if, this is the heart of what's underneath the theory. And the heart is really that if I have two components, how do I combine them? We've all known, even from engineering principles, there are things like parallel and serial composition, just like electrical circuits, different ways of combining things. Well, it's similar in this world of components. We can talk about unions and intersections of, of components, especially when you realize D1 is a set of input output pairs, D2 is a set of input output pairs. As sets, we can union them and intersect. All right, so those are two kinds of typical types of interactions. The union really corresponds to like a parallel process, meaning I can take inputs from either this one or this one. What corresponds to this notion of serial process is this com concept of composition of two components. So let me just pictorially show you, and that will give you the notion of what's going on. Here, you know, let's look at D1 first. It says we have a set of inputs. These two inputs are going to produce these three outputs with respect to this component. Similarly, these two will produce that, these two outputs. So what's occurring in here is a, a component is a set of inputs that you can aggregate together as inputs to produce a set of outputs. What we typically want to do in a composition is what? Enter these inputs into the system to produce these outputs. These outputs come across this barrier to go into the second system. And we do exactly a similar thing. Whatever outputs come out of the first one become inputs to the second system. And from an engineering standpoint, you can think of these as black boxes and these as wires that connect things. So these are output wires from one component to another. When you get inputs to the second system, you do exactly the same type of thing. You take and aggregate the inputs as a set to produce an output as a set. So generating these inputs produces these two outputs. 
which then can crush the barrier as this particular outcome. So what the picture represents graphically is two components up together, two black boxes with wires connecting them. You supply a set of inputs to the first one, let the composition take its effect. These four inputs can be distributed across the definition of the first component and grouping them to produce these outputs, which come across the wire to produce these inputs. These inputs are then aggregated as input sets that produce outputs from the definition of that second component. The outputs of these come through. So what you're really seeing in here is the end result is these four inputs go through these two components to produce these three outputs. So the composition, V1 composed with E2, is what a component which consists of input-output pairs. All I've done is said one element of the composition consists of these four inputs producing these three outputs. Then you look at all possible inputs and outputs as this thing gets aggregated. That's the fundamental definition. Lots of many systems can be put in this framework. The only thing that's important is given this particular definition allows you to aggregate things and talk about the composition of policies and components. I'm not going to get into any descriptions of that. I will leave you to read the paper, but I wanted you to get a little bit of a flavor of what's going on. So let me just take a minute or two and summarize what we've really said. There are basic underlying principles, underlying undefined terms, information units, data, security levels. We give a definition of a component, which essentially is input-output pairs. This is very general, as you can see. Uh, what it amounts to is it's general enough to describe a lot of known systems, and there's been some efforts to do all that. The basic reason to go through such a definition is to be able to allow you, back to answer the original question we talked about, if I know the two components satisfy some security property, how can I hook them together and have some kind of guarantee that the combination does? You have to apply these definitions and apply the underlying theory to allow you to do that. And there's nice, nice examples of all of that. What I want to do is shift some of, the, some of the discussions from what's basically going on over here to where the applications are. But before I, before I do that, I want to know if anyone has any comments or any questions on what we've talked about at this point. Okay, fine. Let's talk about where this theory is going, where it's been applied, and what's, what's still left to be done. This particular theory has been used to analyze security architectures. There is a system called CAR, standing for Contingency Airborne Reconnaissance System, that deals with scheduling of reconnaissance. Uh, the U-2 uh, plane is one of, the, one of the elements of the CAR system. And this is a big, big system. And when, especially when we say contingency airborne, these things are constantly changing. The whole purpose of scheduling all these operations becomes a very, very complicated thing. Has a fairly decent level of security. It really is a B1 system. B1 system evaluated by the National Security Agency. Uh, and also, in terms of after this thing has been developed, the, the composition theory was not used as part of the development process. This is a system that's been ongoing for a long time. But it's being used to look at architectural trade-offs and understand the significance of any decisions that are going on within the system itself. All right, the, it's also been used to model networks. What you see underneath this particular portion was the original work that uh, started off the WPL theory. We, we asked them to try to look at the feasibility of the composition theory using components. Addressing the components I talked about earlier, backplane, trusted file server, trusted greater server, trusted network interface. We've also looked at that from the viewpoint of multiple policies. We've talked before about the notions of confidentiality and integrity. There's also a whole bunch of issues associated with identification, authentication, and access-based control systems. All of these policies with respect to this particular system or more advanced systems 
and then looked at from the viewpoint of what the WDL composition theory will allow us to do. We've seen some promising results in terms of making it easier to understand and make security assertions for building complex systems. What's also occurring along these lines are the applications of this to security policies. Some of you have heard of this notion of non-interference. And non-interference, very briefly, let me take about 30 seconds to go over that. If Cynthia and I are going to be communicating, and I'm not supposed to interfere with Cynthia, what it amounts to is I'm really not interfering with her. Her output should be completely independent of whatever activity I do. So the system should not be able to, dis the output she gets on the system should be completely the same whether I was on the system or not. And there are mathematical ways of talking about all of this. There are, there are actually algorithms that one can go about to determine whether the system is not interfering. Most of the known results are for finite state machines with deterministic systems. The WDL theory, I said before, is a non-deterministic system. You can take, and I have done this, the notions of non-interference, put it in the settings of a non-deterministic viewpoint, define non-interfering components, take the composition of them, and show very easily within a half a page or less of mathematics that the composition of two non-interfering components in a non-deterministic system are still not interfering. So it has a lot of potential to build other theories. One very active area of research going on right now using this composition theory is the ability to look at protocol analysis. A lot of work's been done using logic systems. There's some work being done at our place by a mathematician who's looking at it from an algebraic viewpoint, really trying to look at sets of equations and, look, and trying to solve protocol security problem from the viewpoint of sets of equations using this approach. So, so it clearly has a lot of potential applications. What I want to do is just give one concluding slide and then open things up for, for discussion. Peter Neumann was here before, and I thought it would be appropriate if I took a reference from Peter. Peter has, has written a, an excellent document called Security Risks in the Emerging Infrastructure. This was basically if memory serves me, he gave this before a Senate subcommittee talking about where we're going in the future. And if you haven't read that document, you really should. But what he really, really addressed very, very strongly in this, in this document was this whole notion of composition and what kind of role he thought the government should play. And when you consider where we're going in the future and how we're going to be massively interconnected, and who's going to be on the other end, and what kind of what kind of guarantees or the lack of guarantees we have about who the party is at the other end, you really want to be able to put in things like identification and authentication. And Peter really talks about encouraging development of critical systems. And in particular, the notion of combining these components into complete systems. The only way to really do that is to understand the composition problem and, it, and be able to have some mechanisms to deal with all of that. And this is really, I think one of the most significant challenges we have. I fully expect over the next 10 to 15 years a lot of effort going into this. What, what I've talked about is just a basic theory that needs to be supplemented with lots of tools to make it realistic. It also, also needs to be a lot of interaction with engineers to make this thing practical. But that's basically the, the message that I wanted to give to you. What I'd like to do at this particular point is just stop the presentation and just open it up to questions or comments or Anything you wish to discuss? Yes. Um, I guess another way to think about it is if you have two different components and you got your, your security policy, you say, well, the first component, I'm 90% I'm sure the first component is going to follow this policy and 95% sure that the second component is going to follow this policy. Um, if I say, well, does the WDL theory tell me anything about the composition of these two components? Is it going to, does it really help me in that, in that matter? Or I can say it's 100%. You, you'd really have to say it's 100%, and the way you would go about it is if you say the first component is 90% 90% sure, what you have to do is look at it a little bit further and say, okay, what pieces of it is it going to follow and which ones aren't? And what you're really going to do is essentially say, out of this one component, let me make a subcomponent for which there's 100% assurance. Same thing for the second one. And then you'd say for these subpieces, I know it's going to work. Then that raises the other issue that becomes fundamental. 
what happens to those 5 or 10% on those other pieces where they don't apply for them? And you might have to go through a little different type of analysis. So that's how I would see that helping. If you have two alternatives, either the one I've suggested or then start doing some kind of probabilistic analysis, and then that, and that becomes a little bit different flavor. But if we're talking about stuff that is commercial off the shelf, doesn't that become kind of difficult to be able to separate certain parts? It does of become them? difficult, and what you're talking about is the heart of how difficult this entire problem is when we talk about security. It, and, it, and it gets back to a risk analysis type of viewpoint. If you can live with 90% in one area and 95% in the other, you could say, well, the chances are fairly likely when I combine them, I'm going to be okay. But if you're dealing with confidential information on a particular, if you're a commercial firm, and this talks about the blueprints when, you, when your car, that you don't want competition to have, that 10% is going to be a very high figure. And what you're going to do is make sure that you're going to limit the transfer of the information to those subcomponents. But if, if you're in a sense of information across the internet, as an electronic mail, and you really don't care if there's a small chance that someone else is going to look at it, then that's okay to do. Okay? Any other questions or comments? Yes, Yes, the original question was, was yeah, not everything? No, but you're in the okay. Okay. So, but nevertheless, there's some information distortions. Yes. So, so uh, if we build up a new security for me, then, then it relates to uh, information distortion test. So, where do we work on that? Yeah, it's another element. I would, I would tend to say information dis distortion is probably, you may even think of it as a new element or Another policy that one would have to look at. Uh, Non-interference, if, if, if I send you something and I distort the information, then it's clearly interference on my part. So what I then might have to do is say, in certain situations, I may allow interference, but then I may have to look for something different. And that gets back to the issue that I was raising with Cynthia. If I have to look at data integrity, data integrity will tell me information distortion violates the data integrity policy. Then, in terms of how you might use this particular theory, you might say, I need to define what I mean by distortion, what's allowable and what isn't. Factor that in as another policy and then talk about when that might compose. So, what you're raising is a, a very significant viewpoint in terms of what are all the policies that we need to look at what's important and how to address it. Okay? Yes? So that implies then that you don't have to do field cryptography outside of the model as well. Uh, because you'll certainly not have to impose a case of cryptographic information on the system. Yes and no. On the surface, you're absolutely right. The, the, question, the question was, when you're dealing with cryptography, wouldn't that be outside the WDL theory? Because, because what Dennis was referring to was we talked before about not having information flow off of cryptography, you may want to do some downloading. So you could still handle it within the system in the sense that I might have some components that are required to follow the read-down write-up policy, but I may have another set of components that will allow me to do trusted data for example, and use cryptography on that. So it then becomes a question of defining a separate component or separate policy that will allow that to occur. Cryptography can then be addressed as one of the mechanisms to support an alternative policy and we can all put it together in a whole system setting. But it won't be non-interfering? Probably would not be non-interfering. That's correct. Right. And send it up to the channel. Right. So, so what you could be talking about, and Dennis is then raising raising the whole question of non-interference of an entire system. You're right in the sense that the entire system itself would be non-interfering, but what you may have are some pieces of that that may satisfy a non-interference property, or certain pieces of it that violate it. And that's the beauty of, of, of the theory, in the sense that you can talk about either the whole system itself or smaller pieces. So the mathematics of generality, the level of abstractions, allow you to talk things at lots of different levels. 
depending on what it is you want to focus in on. Does that help? Okay, any other questions? All right, well, I thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity.